everyone and welcome to this week's edition of Trans Stupid, where I take a look at the wonderful world of LGBTQIA plus news because stupidity is intersectional. And I'm going to start this week off with probably the biggest figure that this channel has had, who has once again waded into the world of intersectional news. And that, of course, is Jessica Yaniv, who has, well... It's been a little bit more deranged than what we're normally used to, I think it's fair to say. Now, you probably saw a little bit of the video right at the beginning, but let's take a little bit more of a look to get the full context of what happened. You need, will, you, will you be you pleading go? guilty? Go. What? Go. No, go. don't touch me. Don't touch go. me. Go. Hey! Go. Hey! Go. Stop! Go away from me! Go away! Fucking hell! Go away from me! Jesus, get away from me, go away you fucking from me. crazy fucking get thing! Get away from me! Get away! Get the fuck away from me! Stay away from me! Get away from me! Now! Right now! You heard me? I'm calling the police on you. I don't give a shit! Get away from me! You stay away from me, I'm back- So, yeah, that was Yaniv assaulting a journalist from Rebel Media called Kian Baxty. Now, that was outside of a court where Yaniv was getting a hearing concerning this particular episode. I'm scared of my own house that I'm gonna get fucking attacked and I'm gonna which is illegal in Canada, just saying, but. You think that was like cute? Was that a moment for you? So as you might remember, Yaniv was arrested not long after the stream with Blair White when they decided to pull out an illegal taser to show everyone, don't mess with the Yaniv, I guess. But. Whilst at the hearing back a few weeks ago, Yaniv decided to let loose on Kian because, you know, don't mess with Yaniv again. It was just a deranged assault and this wasn't the first time that we've seen Yaniv act this way on camera, but it was the most graphic so far. And there was a little bit of good news a couple of days ago and that was that Yaniv is now being charged with assault. According to the Post Millennial, Jessica Yaniv was arrested for the assault of a Canadian journalist over the weekend. According to Kian Backstate, the journalist who was assaulted by Yaniv on camera outside of the BC courts on 14th of January, Yaniv spent time behind bars on a charge of assault, and they now may face up to five years in prison. That same day, Yaniv falsely accused TPM's own Amy Eileen Ham of sexual assault whilst at the courtroom. Now, Ham is suing Yaniv for defamation. Now, there was widespread circulation that Yaniv was arrested over the weekend, but the Post Millennial and other outlets were unable to verify the claims at the time. However, Bexty was able to confirm it last Wednesday, and when reached out for comments, Bexty said, Yaniv has been ordered to cease all contact with me, both directly and indirectly. I can't wait for the day when Yaniv is put away for the long haul. He is dangerous and unpredictable. So... Finally, there is more legal action going against Yaniv, and this is something which is very much needed. Yaniv is unfortunately still a bit of a big name, and it's something which really frustrates me because I genuinely thought we were going to see the last of him back in November when he lost the case. That's not really what's happening, though. What we're seeing is Yaniv getting more and more prolific again. Is still a big name and when it comes to this kind of outburst when it's actual assault it's hard not to comment on it because this isn't just a call for attention like when Yaniv was wanting to block Ricky Gervais from entering Canada this is Yaniv actually committing violence against people for annoying him and I know I keep on mixing pronouns between he and they but I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit lazy I suppose not as lazy as Yaniv but certainly a bit lazy with calling this a they it, it, it can be a little bit jarring even for me and I want to say that I generally respect people's pronouns as much as possible provided they put in a little bit of effort now Yaniv's idea of an effort is just a weird photoshop of of himself clearly <laughs> doesn't really relate to reality but I wanted to talk about this for a number of reasons. Um, the main reason we'll, I'll touch on in just a moment. But first of all, maybe this might give us a bit of an insight as to what Yaniv's future is for the rest of 2020 and maybe even beyond. Now, as I mentioned at the start, Yaniv is still in, in trial for 
the taser incident and as I've also mentioned Yaniv has been violent against somebody else so could we realistically see Yaniv end up in jail potentially and I know that that might be a bit of a call uh, but I can't help but feel like at some point this year Yaniv will eventually end up behind bars if it isn't for this particular event it will be for something else Yaniv seems to constantly get away with incredibly toxic behaviour and the ramifications other than the multiple fines from the ball waxing case aren't really that big. Like we're talking like social ostracization, well Yaniv is now world famous, that's more important for Yaniv than anything else. What about the various accusations of pedophilia and the really disgusting messages that we all know Yaniv sends? Some of that really doesn't seem to be getting a lot of traction in the Canadian legal system. Like, there seems to be no progress since all these allegations came to light, and I'm not quite sure what's happening there. But at the very least, we're seeing with these assaults that they are being caught on camera. And if Yaniv isn't sent down for this particular event, he's going to continue to do it until Canada has to take action against the Titanic troon. There's no other option here. Yaniv is becoming more and more toxic, more and more deranged. But it's important to comment on this just because it's probably going to happen. And what will happen then? Like, is Yaniv going to end up in a men's prison or a women's prison? That could be Yaniv season three. Which prison does Yaniv end up in? It turns out in Canada, if you're self-ID as a woman, you could potentially end up in a women's prison. And whilst I don't actually think this is what Yaniv wants because I do think they would just get beaten up in prison anyway. It could still be a bit of a silver lining, it's more coverage at least, it's more exposure to a worldwide audience, and bear in mind that prisoners being able to go into whatever prison they self-identify as is a big hot button issue with a lot of trans activists who always seem to support the self-ID, even if it becomes dangerous. At that kind of moment, Yaniv is effectively forcing their hand to be supportive of Yaniv. It's kind of clever in a stupid way if that would be Yaniv's angle. But I do think that Yaniv will be sent to prison at some point. I think that there is enough derangement out there to really put them away. I think that Yaniv is a danger to wider society. I think Yaniv is a danger to people young and old. The sooner Yaniv is put away, we no longer have to talk about him, the better. But until then, Look at that footage again. This is someone who does need to be highlighted, not for their insane antics, so to speak, but because they are a threat. But this actually leads on to the other topic which I wanted to discuss this week and something which is becoming more and more of an issue, which and I have kind of touched on it in the past, but it's once again been in the headlines. Oxford professor given protection following threats from trans activists. An Oxford professor given protection after alleged threats from transgender rights activists says she did not want to wait and see if she'd get hit in the face before taking action. Selena Todd, modern history professor at St. Hilda's College, said members of staff accompanied her to lectures after learning of threats on social media. Professor Todd has now warned against shutting down debates. The University of Oxford says it did not comment on individual arrangements. The academic told BBC's Radio 4's Today programme she felt vulnerable, having previously experienced hostility from some academics and students. Professor Todd said the threats come from some campaigners who believe her views on the need to protect women's spaces, such as single-sex refuges, from, from people who self-identify as women but are anatomically male, are unacceptable. The academic said she has witnessed quite antagonistic and quite confrontational protests outside women's rights meetings she has spoken at in the past, but she insisted the discussions about women women's rights should not be silenced. It's, she said it's always the case that groups' needs and interests can conflict with those of other equally legitimate groups, but she added that in a democratic state an open debate on how to accommodate the needs of all legitimate groups within a society was needed. Professor Todd told the Daily Telegraph that two students had warned her they had seen threats made against her on email networks they were a part of. The university then carried out its own investigation and found there was enough evidence to provide her with protection. Two male staff members providing protection arrived in lectures before students in order to defuse any potential action that might take place. Now, apparent, now I've not really seen any evidence of exactly what has been said to Professor Todd, although in another article it's referenced that people were turning up to me 
meeting to people are turning up to lectures wearing t-shirts effectively calling her a transphobe now do we need to really is this a really far-fetched situation no it's not if you've ever been on social media and a part of this gender debate, you will have seen the quite vile messages that get thrown to people who have the so-called wrong opinion. And a lot of the time, these are the gender critical feminists. The threats are everyone. They're so easy to find. Just search the word turf. And look, here is a random supply of various tweets from the past week referencing turf. Like, look at them. Now, you can say that, well, these are just people being edgy, but this isn't the way this comes across to your average person. This comes across as actual threats of violence. Now, there's only one side in this debate that really goes this way. I'm sure if you were to look at the words of gender critical feminists, you could probably find a particular nasty person who wants to beat up the tranners. But I've yet to see that. And I've tried searching for it. I'm sure somebody out there will be able to dig it up. But it's so easy to see it on the other side. Now, this doesn't mean that trans activists are there for violence. In fact, actual confrontations between trans activists and gender critical feminists rarely get violent. And it seems to be only if they are Antifa activists that they can be seen to swing punches. People like Tara Wolf, for example are quite rare. I mean, even last year when Julie Bindle was in an altercation with a weird bearded activist who calls himself Kathy Brennan, no punches were actually thrown. Although it's completely understandable why Bindle did think she was going to be assaulted, especially with the kind of language that that Brennan person uses. Now, Trans activists will often try and defend these kinds of rhetorics, the fuck turfs, the walking around with guillotines, all of this idea that they have to do it because the turfs are the ones who are causing the violence. Their rhetoric is killing people. It's causing countless murders. They're being impressioned by the likes of Julie Bindle and Jermaine Greer that in order to go out and kill us and maim us and assault us and humiliate us. And so therefore they think that these violent threats are a valid and justified way of combating it rather than, say, actual conversation, actually treating people as adults. But they don't like doing that. And I mentioned earlier that you really see this only going one way and that kind of goes into the whole rhetoric of trans murders as well. Like, take a look at this recent story which broke on a mass Massachusetts man who had confessed that he murdered his trans activist wife. And that happened all the way back in 2018. Now this happened all the way back in 2018 and this was her husband who admitted to doing this. Not a rabid tra anti-trans activist, but a husband who knew that she was involved in the Miss Transgender pageants. And what about the recent murder of Julie Berman? The alleged killer wasn't a turf, wasn't a neo-Nazi alt-right Pepe spewing bigot. But instead, he's tweeted a lot about all gender restrooms. Now, I should preface that by saying, yes, he is only alleged to have done it, but it still deserves to be pointed out that this is, does not look like it was the turfs who did it, does it? It looks like it was a demented kind of almost a trans activist man. It doesn't really fit the narrative that we're being fed that the TERFs are the ones who are causing the murders. If anything, it's the trans activists who are the ones who are making this debate more and more toxic. That's not to say that every single radical feminist, gender critical view is perfectly fine and reasonable. There are plenty of toxic people on that side of the debate, and I don't even need to name any names, you all probably know who they are. But at the same time, there's a lot of toxicity on the trans side as well. But which one is the one that's issuing threats on Facebook and Twitter? Which is the one that's making their... <laughs> which is the one that's making the other side get bodyguards just to go and do their job? Which is the one that is getting events constantly shut down? Which is the one that's claiming to be oppressed? Bear in mind they are both saying that they are oppressed, but one of them 
claims they're being oppressed whilst effectively having the system on their side and, tell, and getting everyone in the system to do what they want. And then they sit back and think, well, it's fine that this lecturer needs protection. Because, you know, you can't let these bigots go out there with their nasty views and nasty opinions. These are the same people who just defend every single gender as valid and self-ID is completely and 100% acceptable. And they don't really have much of an argument against those points. So they think that it's fine to just threaten. Because you're going to just silence everyone. It's a lot easier than really coming up with an actual conversation on it. But what do you all think of the stories that I've talked about this week? Is there anything in particular I've missed out? Please let me know in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm sorry this video is a little bit shorter than normal. Um, I have been quite busy on other projects and I will be announcing more on those soon. But if you enjoy what you've seen, please like and subscribe. You can also support me on Patreon and Subscribestar. And apparently you can also be a member on my YouTube page as well. Don't quite know how that works, but if any one of you do, you can try that as well. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you all once again. I'll see you all next time. And a special thanks to Alex Meadows, Casey Adolson, Dan Norman, Finello Cooney, Holly Mahone, James C. George, Janine Karen, Jess, Joanne Woolley, Kim Vandry, Latin Creature, Liz Udesu, Moy Felicita, Ricardo Jose, Steve Hendricks, Stephen, Tennessee Barfly, The Poor of Rizzo, Tranime Girl, Stefan Hansen, James UK, Leisha, and the rest of my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar.